Good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF. Uh, welcome back for those of us who have, uh, those who have been on summer break with us. Um, we've restarted Grand Rounds and we're starting again our once a month COVID Grand Rounds. Generally, it will be in the, f the first Thursday of the month and we'll continue doing that as long as we need to, as long as the interest is high as it is and as long as there's new things happening as there are. And uh, as we've done for the last couple of years, we're committed to bringing you the most interesting people, both from UCSF and from around the world. And today is, is clearly uh, no exception to that. Um, the ground rules are the same. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. My colleague, uh, Lexmi Santosh, is monitoring them and will pitch them to me. Um, we will post this tonight on uh, YouTube for people that want to watch it later. If you're interested in CME credit, stay on at the end and there'll be instructions about how to do, uh, do that. Closed captioning is available and uh, we are fully virtual for now. Uh, we'll try again in a hybrid format, probably early 2023 if uh, conditions are appropriate. Uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce today's speaker who's Michael Osterholm, a PhD MPH. I'll do a brief part of his bio. If I did the whole bio, that would take the hour, and that's uh, not what we want to be doing. So uh, Mike is Regents Professor, McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health, and the Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, as well as Distinguished Teaching Professor uh, in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences, School of Public Health, and a few more things, all at the University of Minnesota. Uh, suffice it to say, that uh, that Mike is really one of the world's leading experts on pandemics, pandemics preparedness, and it was so for the last 30 or 40 years, well before uh, this this pandemic has hit us. Uh, he's the author of two best-selling books, over 300 articles, and he has advised every key organization I can think of that's relevant to pandemics, including the CDC, the WHO, the FDA, uh, the Biden White House, and he's won uh, dozens of awards and honors for his work. Uh, I have always been impressed by his thoughtfulness, his deep knowledge, and his willingness and ability to say what he knows and doesn't know, and I'm sure that will come up as we go through uh, the issues of the day, and the format here will be a fireside chat, which is Mike and I chatting for the next uh, uh, 55 minutes or so uh, on a whole variety of issues that relate to COVID and then more broadly relate to pandemics and pandemic preparedness. So, uh, Mike, are you on? There you are. Okay. Hi. Welcome. Great to have thank you. you. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Well, thank you. And I must say at the outset here that uh, these grand rounds have been absolutely must materials for all of us at SIDRAP to follow. We have listened to every one of them that you've posted. And I just want to say you have been an incredibly important voice through this pandemic, helping to guide very thoughtfully and provokingly uh, the issues at hand. So it's a real honor to be here with you today. Thank you. Thanks. That's incredibly nice of you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> You've written books about pandemic preparedness and tried to sound alarms about how do we get ready for the big one. And then the big one hit two and a half years ago. Uh, how did you think our state was and did things surprise you over the first several months? Well, you know, I think first of all, Bob, I, I will preface this by saying I don't think this is the big one. So mm -hmm. let me give an invitation then to what I mean by that. Um, I can remember very distinctly on December 29th receiving a call from one of our news team members at SIDRAP describing to me a very preliminary report out of Wuhan. And of course, like so many, I thought, boy, maybe this could be the big flu pandemic that uh, we might be seeing coming. And uh, by the th 30th, we had enough information that we published on that and said that there was some major event happening in Wuhan. It was unclear. Could this be influenza? We didn't know. And then by the 3rd of January, when in fact uh, it was clear that this was a coronavirus, at least in the initial data coming out, and surely by the 5th we had that, I had this great sense of relief because I had been very involved with both SARS and MERS. In 2003, I was still serving as a part-time advisor at HHS to Tommy Thompson, and so I was involved with the U.S. response to SARS. And then I was quite involved with MERS, having served as a, an advisor to the royal family of the UAE. And then also I was in uh, Samsung Medical Center in Seoul when they had the large hospital-based outbreak in 2015 from someone returning from the Middle East. 
And with both of those diseases, we could control them quite easily once we understood that it was uh, this coronavirus activity and that they weren't likely highly infectious until one to day four or five of their illness. We just had to find them early, isolate, and we were fine. So I was actually quite impressed. Hmm. But then by January 9th and 10th, we had clear and compelling data. Wait a minute, this is not the same coronavirus as MERS and SARS. We were seeing clear and compelling evidence of early transmission, sometimes asymptomatic transmission. It was moving quickly. And actually, by January 20th, we put a statement out from our center saying that this is going to be the next pandemic. Get on with it. And the reason I say that about the big one is because imagine here you have MERS and SARS with case fatality rates of 20 to 30 percent. Here's with with SARS-CoV-2, you have uh, case mortality rates of less than 1 percent. But look at the difference in transmission. What would ever happen if both of those got together in the same coronavirus? where you had high levels of transmission and you had this uh, more severe situation. So I think for us early on, uh, you know, the coronavirus issue is one where we recognize the challenge that were forthcoming. And uh, our, all of us were sitting there saying, so what's next? We, we don't have a playbook for this one. And why, why didn't we have a, did we hit not have a playbook for this one or did we not have a playbook for pandemics? Well, you know, it's easy to go back and be an armchair quarterback right now. You know, I had written about this in my book, Deadliest Enemies in 2017, what a pandemic would look like. Uh, and while I surely used influenza as the model, so many of the things that happened really played out. You know, what happens over 18 months when you have this ongoing activity? What happens in terms of healthcare delivery systems? What happens in terms of public policy? Uh, what happens in terms of business supply issues? I mean, right now, very few people realize that some of the most challenging supply chain issues we have in the entire pandemic is right now because of what China is doing. Very few people realize the vast majority of critical life-saving drugs we use in this country originate in China. Even those from India, the APIs come from China. And right now, we're sitting on the worst time that, in that regard. In San Francisco, ask the people who work at uh, many of the Thai tech companies. Right now, we're having the worst issue with chip availability and as well as uh, uh, just equipment, iPhones and so forth, because of all the lockdowns in China. And so I don't think we really had fully understood that these were all going to be part of what the pandemic was. But I think the thing that most surprised me, and, and really I have to say I probably should have thought of this, was the reluctance of many of my colleagues early on to understand this. You know, after I made that January 20th proclamation that this was going to be the next pandemic, remember it was almost two months before WHO declared a pandemic, I didn't receive nearly as much pushback from the politicians as I did from my colleagues. I went to two different major journals uh, in early February and said, I would love to do a prospectus piece on why this is going to be the next pandemic. Both of them not only turned me down, but one of them actually the next week produced a cartoon that actually detailed why influenza was still much more important than COVID and that we shouldn't get distracted onto the COVID issue. Mm. And there was just a sense of it, this can't be happening. It isn't happening. And I think that, you know, surely by March, people all begin to change their attitude a lot on that. But I think there was as much reluctance in the medical and public health communities to believe this as there was in anybody. Can't be happening because they think probabilistically it's not going to be so big or can't be happening. We don't want to scare people. What, what, what's the motivation? I, I think it was all of that. I think it was the fact that it can't be happening. It's a coronavirus. We've been here before. We can handle these. They didn't understand the difference between the transmission characteristics of SARS and MERS versus SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think the second piece of it was the fact that uh, you know, we've had so many of these scares before, H5N1, you know, all these different things were going to come and get us and they never did. Some people would say H1N1 in 2009 was grossly overdrawn in terms of what it was representing as a pandemic. Yeah. And so I think that there was also just that. There was a failure of creative imagination to imagine, well, what if it was all these things? What would it mean? And I think that surely contributed to it. It, it, it wasn't that people were trying to be blind. I think it was they were coming from their base of experience and their experience said this can't be happening. 
And for someone like you who follows this stuff for a living, if I, I didn't do this and won't do this, but if I went back and looked at your proclamations prior to H1N1 or, 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 uh, or some of the other, would I find uh, alarms being pulled? In other words, were, were people sort of rationally saying, we've been told by pandemic experts the big one is coming and it never quite played out, and therefore it's sort of rational to downplay it? Or, or were you, are you or were you able to calibrate, this is not going to be so bad and here's why? You know, I think that it was uh, both a combination of it can't be that bad. This is modern public health and modern medicine, you know, just like we saw with 2009. Remember, with H1N1, which everyone was concerned about, which actually did extract a very high price in terms of years of potential life loss that most people don't realize. But remember, the pandemic virtually disappeared without any kind of pharmaceutical interventions. And remember, vaccine didn't even arrive until late September, early October, when the summer peak was on its way down and out. It was already over. Mm -hmm. And so people said, well, that's a pandemic. You know, we know how to deal with these now. They're different than 1918. We have modern medicine. So I think there was that sense that we can handle it and that we don't need to worry about that because it's there. So and I think the, the other piece to it was the fact that um, in terms of we have had all of these warnings, you might say, about what was coming out. And I think that we ourselves didn't do a good job of saying, well, but if this is true, how prepared are we? Remember just one year before the pandemic began, you know, Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Biosecurity put out a document based on a number of experts saying we were the most prepared country in the world for a pandemic. Yep. We're ready. You know, and I think that we actually had a, a fair amount of hubris about just how well we were able or would be able to respond to something like this. And we found out we weren't. Yeah. And I mean, we'll we'll get onto the clinical aspects, yeah. soon, but but are we better now? You know, I think that uh, in many ways we're not. I think we're worse. Mm. And I say that because, uh, you know, if anything, what we've learned in our healthcare systems is the major challenges in modern healthcare financing and a healthcare delivery system, which is really all about a disease care delivery system, that we, we exposed many, many of the challenges. I mean, we've lost 500,000 nurses in the last two years who have left the business. Look mm -hmm. at the number of physicians. Uh, and so I think that in many ways, we've stretched things out such that um, I don't think we would respond. If we had another big one right now, I bet you Congress would take a long, hard look before they put another dollar into financing anything to deal with it. Look at the hearing yesterday uh, about monkeypox, where CDC and the FDA and NIH got taken to the woodshed uh, up from the congressional uh, invest, uh, uh, questioners and there was no sense that any more resources are needed for monkeypox. Just do what you're going to do. Mm. And so I think in some ways we've we've actually burnt some goodwill. And I think public health trust right now is probably the lowest I've ever seen it in the 47 years I've been in the business. Is is that fair on the part? It, it, it's people looked at the CDC, looked at the public health system, uh, the trust in it, I think, partly is related to flaws that they've seen in the system. So is that a reasonable assessment on their part? I think it actually is reasonable for some of the issues. Other issues, I don't think it is. A pandemic is just tough. You know, uh, I've said all along, you know, we, we surely heard about the challenges with monkeypox. But when you go back and look at it and what we had, we at least had a vaccine. Yes, was it a delay in getting vaccine out? Yes, it was. But if you understood the challenges of what was happening there, how fast it finally did get out, unlike some who made predictions this was going to be, you know, a doomsday scenario would spread and spread and spread it. It hasn't. And I think, though, that that most people don't really understand that when a pandemic begins to unfold, I don't think you can prevent it. Despite the common belief out there, we can prevent pandemics. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. I think once an infectious agent that's highly infectious takes off, our only real hope is containment, trying to minimize it. Yeah. Have we exposed sort of a particular challenge in America around pandemics with kind of our libertarian streak and our questioning of expertise and who are you to tell me that I need to wear a mask or get a vaccine? Is has that become clearer than at least you thought three years ago? Yeah, I think it is. I think one of the other issues, and you noted this in your very kind introduction, 
is I think one of the most valuable lessons I've learned, not just in this pandemic, but in my entire career, is the absolute necessity for humility in our business. You know, as scientists, we like to think facts are everything and we've got them just like a six shooter in the side. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There's a lot of things we don't know and understand. And I think what's happened is we've made so many pronouncements that didn't turn out to be that, but we did it with such certainty that we had no room to say, well, now we've learned more. This is what we've learned. This is where it's at. And I think combined with modern media, you know, the media ended up picking, uh, you might say, media favorites, you know, the talking heads that put out pronouncements left and right as mm -hmm. to what would happen, when it would happen, how it would happen. And many of those didn't turn out to be like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that the public and in some degree, I think our own medical community became uh, distrustful of these kinds of pronouncements. And I think one of the things we're going to need to do is go back and look at how do we message what do we message, you know, and, and, and the willingness to admit what we know and don't know. And if we don't know what we're going to do to try to find out. Great. Let's uh, pivot a little bit just to the current state of the pandemic. How, how do you, I mean, this is a broad question. We'll narrow it down <laughs> variants and vaccines and boosters and all that kind of good stuff, but just as a general 35,000 foot view, what do you think about the pandemic today? What, what strikes you about today's situation? Well, I'll use my disclaimer caveat and then explain more. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that when you look at what's happened in the history of the pandemic in terms of the unfolding and its epidemiology, you know, we first saw what I would consider to be the country by country, location by location hit that surely did not, was not widespread everywhere in early 2020. If you're in New York, if you're in Milan, you're in certain cities, it was an amazing challenge. But for many of us, it wasn't at all. I mean, we had large parts of our state here in Minnesota, rural Minnesota, that had no cases for weeks and weeks, yeah. and they wanted to know why they were shut down. And that changed with the variant development uh, in the summer of 2020. And I think that was for me. Early on, uh, we kept hearing about variants uh, or uh, changes, at least in terms of the virus, and almost kept attributing those to almost like rings in a tree. Well, you could age the virus, you could do this, nothing about its functionality or its transmission. And when Alpha appeared in late 2020, that was a true, true eye opener for me, because I saw now a virus that was all about what was going to happen with the variants. What would happen with transmission? What would happen with immune evasion? And in fact, it was in late January that I publicly said, I thought the darkest days of the pandemic were still ahead of us. Well, I was quartered and hung out to effigy at that point by many of my colleagues because vaccine was flowing. Uh, people thought, saw this big mountain peak of cases in, in November, December, and early January dropping precipitously. And yet I saw the variants coming. And mm -hmm. so, you know, by the time Delta hit and then Omicron hit, the darkest days did appear later. And I think that we got used to this mountain valley kind of uh, combination. Well, then along comes BA5. And here we've been in a high plain plateau for the last 12 weeks. Today, the New York Times, 487 deaths reported today over the seven day average. OK, you know, we've been between 450 and 525 deaths now for 12 weeks every day. Number four cause of death in the country. What's happening? Well, we know that the public has, they're done with the virus. They're back functioning largely as they were pre-pandemic. And BA5 has just continued to do what it does uh, and has been this challenge where, it, you know, if these numbers of cases and these uh, deaths that occurred two years ago, it would have been a, you know, house on fire moment. Today, it's a shifting baseline. It's mm -hmm. just normal. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what's going to happen next? And I don't think any of us can predict, just as we couldn't have predicted the high plane plateau 12 weeks ago. And so I'm watching carefully the subvariants. You know, 2.75 was supposed to possibly do it, didn't appear, but now all of a sudden 2.75.2 is coming along. Uh, what will be the next variant? What will be uh, the next subvariant? Will that change what it looks like? I think the other wild card that when you ask me where we're at, I think the data around uh, immune evasion is huge. You know, uh, I thought one of the most important pieces of information presented at the ACIP meeting two weeks ago 
was not about the vaccines as such, BA4, BA5, was what was the vision study data showing that, in fact, if you looked at uh, the rate of hospitalization after four doses of vaccine among those who are uh, 50 years of age or older, at 100 days, the prevention against hospitalization was only about 65% and it was dropping precipitously. If you look at those for three doses for the whole 18 old years of age and older population, that protection was only at that point about 60 some percent and dropping. So I think we still haven't figured out immune evasion yet. What's going to happen? You know, are these vaccines after 10 months without, uh, you know, a booster or without another infection? What will it look like? And I don't think any of us can say at this point we know. When when Alpha first hit, were you? It sounds like you were surprised by that. From following other viruses over the years, was that not a predictable thing that variants ultimately would change the you know? Because we were used to. I remember saying to the press many times in the first year, "Oh yeah, these are little typos; they don't mean anything." And then all of a sudden, that was wrong. Uh, is, was that a predictable thing that we would see variants and they would change the fundamental nature of the virus and how it interacted with us? You know, I, I can't say that it was wrong. I think that it was our lack of experience. You know, I have the good fortune right now of leading a major effort at our center to develop a pan-coronavirus vaccine roadmap uh, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and Gates. And we have over 65 international experts involved, everybody from the most basic R&D all the way up to manufacturing and financing. And in working with the geneticists, particularly the viral geneticists, the people who really have spent their lifetimes on coronaviruses, you know, they may have had a sense that this was potentially going to happen. But I think most people didn't have a sense. And one of the challenges we had, and I think I've surely, as much as anyone, you know, I kept coming back to that mindset of influenza. Well, if we look at influenza, this is what it did or how it did it. And in fact, uh, John Barry, the uh, historian from the 1918 influenza pandemic, Mark Lipsitch uh, from Harvard, who went to CDC to help develop the Prediction Center, and I wrote a piece on, in April of 2020 saying, what might this pandemic look like? And we laid out a whole set of scenarios. If it looked like a flu pandemic, it'll do this. If it, in fact, uh, there is very little protection and we don't have vaccines right away, it might look like this. And I don't think any of us had any idea that but I could see once the variants did have an impact, clearly not just on how old was the virus, as you said, but in fact about transmission, about the ability to evade immune protection. To me, that's all bets were off. Mm -hmm. and, and so to me, that's where, you know, when I said back in January of 2021 that the darkest days of the pandemic were likely still ahead of us, I was basing that completely on what I was seeing with the variant development. And uh, I think that at that point, people just didn't understand or see the same thing. Yeah, I'm guessing the answer to this is I don't know, but it feels like over the last eight months or 10 months, it's been a, a new variant every one to two months, each one a little bit better at its job of infecting people and, and immune evasion than the prior one. And BA5, the pattern was, all right, there's going to be another thing two months from now, and there has not been one that's emerged that's better at its job than BA5 for now, I guess, four or five months. Is that just random? We just had, a, in some ways, a lucky period? Don't, or, don't know. Yeah. I mean, clearly, it's survival of the fittest, you know, and we'll have to see what variant or subvariant comes out of this. But again, talking to the viral geneticists, uh, the uh, you know coronavirus experts, they fully expect to see new variants and subvariants. Mm -hmm. What we don't understand yet is from a functionality standpoint, what will that mean? Will they be potentially more transmissible? You'd argue that for someone to take over a B BA5 crown, they would have to be more transmissible. Uh, could it be that it's just they evade immune uh, evasion? Uh, and then I think again, the host itself, you know, we are still trying to understand, and, and the coronavirus people knew this a long time ago, that immunity to coronaviruses were something that largely was short-lived and not necessarily comprehensive and complete. So what will happen? Will, will we see susceptible people coming back into the potential pool of vulnerable people when they weren't two or three months ago? I don't yeah. know that. Well, it sounds like we, I mean, we sort of already are if the vaccine efficacy has waned and 
you were infected six months ago or you got your booster eight months ago, it seems pretty clear you're more vulnerable today than you were four months ago. Isn't that that, that part? Clear? Yeah, yes, I think that's true. I think the question is, will there be reduced severity of illness, the pathogenicity mm -hmm. and the virulence of the virus, the ability to cause disease, the ability to cause severe disease, will that change? And, you know, again, uh, when we look at these deaths, you know, 450 to 500 deaths a day, and it just continues and continues, we need a lot more information on those deaths to understand why. Uh, what are we missing? Are they just not vaccinated? Are they vaccinated, but they're older populations with underlying health conditions? Are there things that we can do to help bubble and protect them more? And I think that uh, at this point, we just don't have those data. We're working on it right here in Minnesota, trying to uh, get that kind of information so that we can better articulate not so much stopping the virus transmission, but stopping severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. Great. A few questions coming. Let me do a few more. Let's shift to the boosters <laughs> for a second. Um, what do you think about the new booster, and are you getting them? Well, I'm going to get mine. Yeah. Uh, I'm ready in a little while to, to get it, but I don't know what it's going to mean. And again, uh, you know, I provided the data on the four booster uh, outcome with BA5. It's not good. Mm -hmm. And with time, it wanes. Uh, I don't know that the current uh, BA4, BA5, uh, you know, bivalent vaccine is going to provide us with that much more protection. I think, uh, how do I say this politely, but I think there's been far much ha too much happy talk about it. Uh, I think that it surely could offer some protection. I think getting a dose of anything at this point in a booster way is helpful. Having said that, I, we can't boost our way out of this pandemic. You know, only 26% of those 65 years of age and older prior to the arrival of this booster had their fourth dose that they could have had. And so I think that we're going to continue to lose people that way uh, over time. And as you have said yourself many times, a vaccine is not a vaccination. And so until we get that, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so I think over time, we won't go to a once a year booster and have that be effective. Uh, I just don't think that's going to occur. It won't be effective because it won't last for the year. Or won't be it won't last. It's not going to draw people into where they're just not going to get it. I think it's both. I think it's they're not going to get it and it won't last. And, and you know, I might even add just a comment because, again, uh, you know, maybe I'm the outlier here, but I was actually disappointed that HHS took the approach of saying, OK, let's make your flu shot and your COVID booster shot kind of one and the same, one in each, you know, in a different arm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as someone who has worked a long, long, long time on flu, uh, you know, we've published the data on us as others looked at this about the overall loss of protection with flu vaccine following vaccination. And clearly we have shown time and time again, even when a flu vaccine is well matched and may work, you lose 18 plus percent protection per month. Mm. And we have always said, you know, the September vaccination program is just wrong. It's too you early. Know, I will never get my flu vaccine before early November unless there's activity in the community, then I'll get it right away. Now, I know that can create a problem, a bottleneck trying to get people vaccinated, but I've seen far, far too many influenza epidemics occur in late January, early February, where vaccine efficacy approached zero. And part of that was waning immunity. So I think the same thing may very well happen with the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, even the bivalent is, is that what happens after four or five months after that, and we still have circulating virus out there, we always see so many breakthroughs that the once a year uh, booster is not going to be sufficient. And, and I just don't think we know at this point. Yeah, I think I'm from having talking to, spoken to Shisha about it. I mean, it was a very sort of pragmatic decision that's not that we think it's going to last for a year in terms of preventing all infections but if we could get the the frequency of taking the covid shot up to levels that are similar to the flu shot we'll be better off overall is, is that completely no i think that's thing? fair i think that's fair i think we have a much larger challenge getting people vaccinated for covid yeah uh, okay. and i think that people have moved on uh you know there is a survey out today from axios uh, which has ironically been ongoing since uh, early 2000 about human behavior and their response to COVID. They announced with this survey data today was the last one they're collecting. They're done doing this now after several years. And it basically just confirmed 
the public is done with this pandemic, Goodness, yeah. you know? And yeah. so I don't think COVID shots are for many people, even something on their radar screen. Yeah. So I'm scheduled to get my COVID and flu shots this weekend. My last, my fourth booster was maybe <laughs> seven months ago. So would you recommend I get the COVID shot and not the flu shot? Well, that's what I would do, but I realize that's not standing recommendations and who am I, I to go against standing you know recommendations. more about this than I do, so that's well, what I, I do. No, but I think the point <laughs> of it is, is I think from a flu standpoint, uh, Helen Branswell at Stat News did a wonderful piece this week in which she interviewed a number of the flu experts who across the board said, uh, you know, no, get it later. Really? The yeah. only flu experts I know that didn't say that are the same ones that I know personally are getting their shots in September and a second dose in January. Oh, wow. OK, <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, um, the public I, I, just a brief anecdote for me. I was doing a TV interview the other day and they <laughs> like the, the it, it, people seem over it. And they showed me the poll an NBC New po News poll that had threat to democracy. Thirty five percent like the major concern went down. And COVID was 1%. People saw it as a major threat. And I said, you know, the threat to democracy is a big deal. And uh, he said, yeah, but COVID polls below other. Other is 4%. I said, no, that's not right. It should not be below other at this point. Um, the, the fact that the public is over it, was that predictable? Is, 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 is the public's attention span last two years for other threats like this? Is that what we saw in 1918? Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think that that is a very interesting observation. Actually, John Barry has well documented that in 1918, most people actually followed the public health recommendations of non pharmaceutical interventions. But that by about the end of 1919, and most people don't realize the 1918 pandemic went well into 1920, uh, 21. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some very large spikes of cases in a year to 18 months after the original one. And exactly what you just said happened. People just no longer abided by any of the public health recommendations. They just went about doing their business, et cetera. And it was as if psychologically they had hit a peak. And I think yeah. that we surely have seen that. I think the division right now politically in which unfortunately this vaccine and the whole disease got mired into has not helped because it's not just about people are fatigued. People actually have very, very strong feelings about, you know, one way or the other on what to do about COVID. Yeah, I want to ask, so Erica Pan from, uh, from CDPH asked, uh, for your perspective on the politicization and what, is there anything you think we could do differently in the future to deal with this idea that, you know, you sort of choose which team you're on and if you're on one team, you don't believe in mass, you don't believe in vaccines? Well, you know, I, I have to say that, first of all, I, uh, I probably am going to answer this from a very personal perspective, and, and that may not give you the right answer. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, I have tried throughout the duration of this pandemic to be measured and to just say what I know and don't know, as we've talked about, and when I don't know it well. And, you know, I will stick with my record. And yet, over the course of the past uh, two years, I've had a number of death threats. I've had a number of really unfortunate, painful situations. Uh, the point of where I'm in some public events, I have to have a security guard. Hmm. And I'm not the voice of craziness, I think. You know, I'm, I'm not out there recommending uh, things that others would say, you know, are irresponsible or, in, you know, inciting a riot. And so I think it's so friable as a topic that it doesn't matter to a certain degree who it is that's trying to lead. Uh, it's just that alternative facts issue. And if you believe in that, as you believe in so many other political issues, then you believe that, you know, there were major mistakes and, and damage done that shouldn't have happened. And so I don't know going into the next pandemic, I think we have a lot of work to do to try to understand that. And I think one of the things that I, would urge, we need to have a very careful, in-depth review of the media. I think that the media assembled themselves to deal with this pandemic uh, without any real science training in most cases. Uh, you know, they picked certain talking heads to be the favorite people, and that became the factual basis for everything thereafter. And uh, I think that the challenge we had was my facts versus your facts when it was actually us as scientists doing that. 
And, and I think that led people to have a lot of distrust in the scientific world. I think we have to do a much better job of how we communicate, what we communicate, and the media has to do a lot of work in learning how they better can understand how do we cover stories? Mm -hmm. Who do we actually rely on? You know, I, there was, there's a major group in the United States that has put out one estimate after another in their modeling. We have tracked it very carefully. They have been wrong virtually every time, completely mm -hmm. wrong. And well, yet, you, you can know, count on them. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, unfortunately, but you know you what? The, me wrong. the media continued to use them yeah. making these pronouncements. And so I think that's been one of the challenges is how do we do also with the media going forward? Yeah. It goes without saying that the media is not what the media used to be. It is so diffuse and people yeah. are choosing their own adventure about who they follow. So, you know, that's that's one thing that to think about the traditional media and then wholly another to think about the media media. Um our, uh, our Chief Clinical Officer Josh Adler asked, what is your current thinking about the cause of death in patients who, quote, die of COVID? And, you know, as you said, BA5 has been plateaued, 400 deaths a day, 500 deaths a day. Are a lot of those deaths not from COVID and are incidental? And how do we sort of, how do yeah. we test that out? Well, and is it even important? I th well, I think it is important in the sense that, again, it's another point of controversy. I think that the you know issues, first of all, of the immediate death, think of the following California scenario. You live in an area with dense brush, not been cleared out for years. You have a severe drought. You got 90 mile an hour winds and you live in your house and you're there. Nothing happens. Then one day, a spark comes from your electrical grid or somebody throws a match and a cigarette in there and the next thing you know, the whole community burns down. Well, the community didn't burn down until that match got thrown or that spark got lit. Well, to me, that's really a model for COVID in a way, because so many of these people do have underlying health conditions that are important, but that's not what would have killed them. Mm -hmm. It was the COVID in infection that was so important and responsible. I think the second thing that we're going to look back on are a lot of the uh, illness, uh, in, in acute situations with thrombosis, et cetera, that we, the in, inflammatory issues that sometimes are weeks to months down the road. And the question is just what was cause and effect there? And then finally, the piece that I think are almost the ghost cases that won't be associated with COVID, but in every way have some indirect way of relating to COVID and that's all the misdiagnoses over those last two years of cancer. I, I happen to have a personal friend who deferred and deferred and deferred on a colonoscopy because of, col of COVID. And sure enough, now he's got colon cancer that probably had been detected two years ago. He would have done much better. Um, and so I think that that too has been one that we haven't fully appreciated is just what that is. So, so could somebody be diagnosed as a COVID death because they were in an automobile accident? Oh, by the way, they happen to have COVID at the time. Sure. I think that could be the case. I don't think that happens often, mm -hmm. but I think nonetheless that, that can and does occur. Yeah. Sorry to hear about your friend. Yeah. Um, let's uh, talk about long COVID for a sec. Um, I mean, when people ask me, like, why I'm still being careful, and I still am in terms of mask and all that, I basically say I no longer fear that I'm going to die of COVID, which is unlike March 2020 when I was hiding under my kitchen table. Uh, it, it really is, uh, you know, I've had four shots and I'm 64 and reasonably healthy. That, that really doesn't cross my mind. But I look at my wife, who's five months out from her case, and she still is fatigued and needs to take a nap after three hours of working and brain is not quite right. And then there's all this accumulating epidemiologic evidence. I don't know, sort of love to hear your take on it of like one year risk of MI, of, uh, of stroke, of diabetes, of cognitive decline, which seems pretty concerning. So how do you yeah. put that together in terms of what you think the real risk of long COVID is and how, it, how does it influence your own decision making about your risk behavior? Well, if I could uh, give a better statement than you, I don't know what it would be because I'm in exactly the same boat under yeah. the table, long COVID <laughs> concern. And I think that that is a real challenge. And I think that ultimately we're going to see that. You know, I, I, I find it interesting that we in this country are singularly focused on our own economic peril and the inflation issues, which surely are reasonable. You know, what's happening is, is really a challenge. But we fail to realize 
that the whole world right now is in the same boat. There are countries whose rates of inflation are many, many times ours. And guess what? Workforce issues are problems in many of these countries. COVID has fundamentally changed that. And how much of it is just because people were not willing to go into work, they were concerned about the work, or that because they actually had long COVID-like symptoms. And you know, as, as the more studies become available, it surely has had an impact on our economy. And mm -hmm. just when you have a tight labor market, even taking out one to 2% of the population because of potential long COVID is a huge, huge hit. So I think that at a, at a country and at a, a global level, long COVID is going to have a much bigger impact for a longer time than people realize. I think from an individual level, I had spent some time in my career studying chronic fatigue syndrome, trying to understand what the mechanisms might be for that very real condition. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to see the uh, t uh, parallels between some of what's happening with COVID and some of what happened with chronic fatigue syndrome. So I think this post-infectious uh, situation, whether it's immune-mediated, uh, you know, what happens from a thrombi inflammatory process, what is happening with cognitive function, and how much of that can be attributed to, as you've seen recent reports looking at, uh, you know, close examinations, MRIs of the brain, et cetera, I think we're going to be studying this for some time to come, but I, the, the footprint of COVID is clearly more than just an acute infection uh, or a serious illness, and then we're all better after a few weeks. I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah. So let me ask you about your choices for, for a sec. So uh, indoor dining today? Indoor dining in my home with guests who have to agree for the pre previous days, no known exposure to anyone who had uh, any symptoms suggestive of COVID, including uh, allergy like conditions, no one with allergy like conditions and testing negative uh, within six hours of the event. And we've actually had a series of small dinner parties here and they've been wonderful. Uh, anytime I'm in any other setting than that, I have my N95 on. Uh, at school. So you will not you will not go to an indoor, indoor dining. You will not go to a restaurant. I do not. I do not. Is there some level of COVID, and if so, how would you measure that? Where you would say I will go and eat indoors or go to a bar? Well, I'm going to have to get there someday, and yeah. and 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 I'm I'm actually personally wrestling with that myself. When will I feel comfortable? And like you, I don't think I'm going to die from COVID, mm -hmm. but I don't want to get long COVID, mm -hmm. and I have too many friends and colleagues that do have it. And so, you know, at some point, I can't be irrational and say, well, I got to live my life. You know, right. my risk is greater of having a bad outcome driving to work than it is being at work. Uh, and, and I have to deal with that. But I think there are many of us who are still struggling with that. And, you know, if I had six more months of a BA5 just slowly landing to a soft landing, then I think I'd feel very different. I follow the wastewater data very closely. Yeah. You know, and I don't know at what point I'll say, well, it's low enough. Now I'll do this. But uh, so, that, so even I mean, you're <laughs> in, in some ways, you're the person I would turn to to say, what is your number and, and yeah. a number of what? You don't have a number yet. You have a I'm not going to this can't be forever, but it's not today. So I'm right. I would, I, I would, to figure I, out what is you, how would you how will you decide on that day? Is it just you're exhausted and it's time? I'll probably call you up and say, I right. think today's the day. <laughs> well, I, I, I said five, I said five cases per hundred thousand per day in my county. Yeah. San Francisco, I think today, it's, San Francisco I think, today is eight. I think it's something like that. I think it is something like that. Yeah. And that's what I think. And that's actually going to be important to support a number of us, older individuals in particular, coming out. Yep. You know, how do we do that? You yep. know, and how comfortable will I be? Yeah, and, I mean, and the number came partly because it seems to correlate pretty well with our asymptomatic test positivity rate yeah, yeah. of, you know, sort of one in a hundred of people who feel fine will test positive. And that's a number where I think I can tolerate the risk of going you do indoor dining, but it's like, you know, a lot of hand waving here. You're right. And this is one where, again, I don't know. And this is a very personal I don't know. My own family, my friends, we're all in the same boat. OK, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you're, are you, you comfortable traveling? Uh, I'm not, but I have to. For example, as some of your audience will know, next week is viral disease meetings in Belfast, and I'm giving a 
couple of presentations there. So I'm taking my first international trip next week. I will get on the plane. My N95 will be on. I will probably be so dehydrated by the time I get to Belfast. You're not taking it off even for a, for a sip of something. I may, I may try to get a sneak of a real yeah, no, sip. That's what in, I do. I like it. <laughs> that's exactly it. You know, that's almost, we have a whole new body language for how to do that. You right, know? And right. I think that's exactly what I do right now. Yes. Yeah probably more likely to die from aspirating on the, you know, while trying to chug my cranberry juice. Um, uh, if you got, have you had COVID yet? I have not. Yeah, that you know of, no, nor I. No, I, nor, no, that I know of, you're right. Yeah. I, I've only been tested by antigen, not by uh, serology. If you got it today, would you take Paxlovid? I would. And how are you thinking about the, the, the rebound and is five days the right course and all that stuff? Well, I don't know if five days is the right course, but I find it curious that, you know, there are two studies out now showing 20 to 30 percent rebound with COVID for people who never took Paxlovid. Right. And to me, you know, I, I don't know that the rate of rebound is any different among those that have taken the drug than those that haven't. So I think this rebound caused by the drug, I think, is way premature. Uh, we need better studies to actually look at both, you know, what is the frequency of these rebound kind of events. Uh, I think the data that I've seen continues to support the fact that it does reduce significantly the likelihood of developing serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. For me, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm still on that bandwagon. My concern is we need more and new antivirals. Uh, and, and I worry about, you know, what's going to happen with these antivirals over time with the virus, too. So we, we surely need more work in this area. I have to say I'm flabbergasted that six months later we still don't have a trial of five days versus ten days. It's I, I actually, I, there are some going on right now, but, no. uh, but they're, they're far from complete. I think no. you're right. You're no. right about that. Yep. As we pivot, an overused word, but sort of to thinking about this in terms of long-term strategy, what is reasonable for Congress to be doing in terms of funding? Are we paying enough attention to ventilation and sort of things that, if, if this is a, a version of our forever world, what should we be doing that we're not doing now? Well, there's a lot. You mentioned ventilation. You know, our group was very involved early on with uh, forwarding the concept that this was an airborne uh, virus. And that, in fact, that kind of transmission was very important. And anything short of high-level respiratory protection would, at very best, just reduce somewhat the risk of, of transmission. Uh, and so I think one is we really have to concentrate on respiratory protection, both in terms of the kind of, of mask, as they call it, we use. You know, what we have right now is largely industrial, professional N95s which are not well suited for many people uh, in terms of comfort levels, in terms of how they can use them for kids. And we need a crash program in that to, to develop new and better masks uh, and to then educate the public. I think if there was one area the CDC fell down on badly, it was the whole issue of airborne uh, transmission and the protection. Uh, and, and the fact that is today, you know, we have very few people who wear quote unquote masks, but if you look still 80% plus are surgical masks. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, it was very hard for me because I was in several medical care facilities during the course of the pandemic where I was told I had to take my N95 off as I was coming in the door because I had to put on a surgical mask because that was their standard there. Okay. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with us? That's wacky. And, yeah. and I think so we did I, that. I think we would that we did that too. So yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. Crazy. So I mean I think that we have a lot of work to do there, both in terms of developing new materials that can with electrostatic charges that can be better used. The second thing is, and I know this is a very hard topic because it'll be misinterpreted, but you know, we really don't understand what the level of ventilation is needed to reduce substantially the risk of a airborne virus transmission. That's why we don't have a national standard as such. Mm -hmm. And we need a, a crash program in ventilation research. NIOSH should be really, really supported strongly to get us better data and to say, what can you do to reduce the risk of transmission? You know, I use that old analogy. If you get, you know, we're all going to go on the crosswalk and you get hit by a semi at 60 miles an hour, that's not good. Well, if you do the same crosswalk, you get hit by a Ford F-10 pickup truck, that's not good. Well, heck, if you get hit by a, a Honda motorcycle at 65 miles an hour, that's not good either. Right. So what is it that's necessary to actually reduce the risk 
in ventilation. And so we need a lot more work in that area. We don't know. That's interesting because people sometimes get on the airplane and say, oh, I hear that they have good ventilation and filtering. It, it's not, we don't know that that's good enough. You know, it, it is better, but uh, you know, even there, it uh, that has been overstated. I can tell mm -hmm. you that has been overstated. Uh, and we're a lot better off than we were in the old days of smoking when the tar and nicotine would plug up the filters immediately mm -hmm. along the side of the skin of the, of the airplane. But there still are challenges uh, you know, with that. I, I, I was involved working up a multi-drug resistant TB case that had flown from Europe to Minnesota in a 747 on the upstairs cabin. And when we actually took that same plane up and did smoke studies, we found that the air bounced from the cabin, came down the steps and deposited 30 rows back. Oh my goodness. And, you know, it's that kind of situation where you realize that oh, isn't quite laminar flow here. It's not quite as yeah. good as people think it is. So I think even that we have a lot more work to do and, and not to say that anybody did wrong, but don't accept the fact that, oh, it's OK. Yeah. And I often feel like that this you come on a plane. The flight attendant should have a sign that says I can guarantee to you that someone on this plane currently has COVID. Because the <laughs> current level of prevalence, it, it is absolutely a guarantee that in a group of 150 <laughs> one person at least has, and they may be sitting next to you. So, yeah. Uh, let's talk for a minute about kids. Um, we have questions coming in about kids and schools and all that. So, what's your current thinking about what's the safety of schools, kids, and masks, and all that? You know, a lot of complicated questions. Yeah. Well, it's someone with five grandkids uh, yeah. between the ages of uh, four and 12, I have a real interest in this. Uh, and I think that first of all, we have to understand that the pandemic and through the course of it was not the same for kids from beginning to end. That first year we were involved looking for COVID and it, both illnesses and infections in school kids. And we saw very little, very little. It wasn't until Alpha showed up that we really saw a dynamic change. And for reasons I cannot explain, again, it's humility, but if you may recall, when Alpha first made it to the United States in late December and January of 2020 and 2021, we were one of two states, Michigan and Minnesota, just got pounded with Alpha. It was some of our worst days. And yet we had other areas all around us that had very little Alpha activity. And what we saw the foci were, were schools. Schools mm -hmm. were really critical in disseminating that. Well, that only amplified even more with Delta and it really amplified with Omicron. So one of the challenges we had a lot of the early data, which didn't support transmission, we kept getting brought back up saying schools are not a problem. OK, well, they were they were a problem and we saw widespread transmission. And again, most of the respiratory protection that kids used was useless, absolutely useless. You know, I was putting a nice, colorful face covering in front of someone's face is not going to protect them in that kind of setting. Now, having said that, if, for example, the big challenge we had keeping schools open here in Minnesota uh, back in January with Omicron was not all the sick kids. It was all the sick teachers, the bus drivers, the administration. And when, when you have a janitor running a study hall of 300 kids in a school because nobody else was there to take care of them, you know, you knew you had a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that we have to recognize this has been much more common in kids. Now, it's still a much lower risk situation in kids in terms of, of serious illness. But I also find a disconnect here. And I do understand it's a cost benefit with vaccine, potential adverse events. But there have been over 550 children in the United States under age five who have died from COVID. And when most of those have died during this past year with Omicron, when you look at that and, and think about what are we gonna do about it, right now only 3% of kids under age five are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. As much as those parents who wanted vaccine badly were very loud and made it seem as if it was overnight, all these kids are gonna get vaccinated, only 3% are vaccinated. And so I think that you know we still have a lot of work to do to understand risk benefit, what are parents' concerns, uh, what does that mean? But this is clearly an infection in kids. It does occasionally cause that severe illness. And we have to understand that. And it's not just a benign disease, as some would lead you to believe. Uh, 
what do you tell your kids to do with their with your grandchildren in terms of going to school and masking today, assuming it's well, uh, you know, mask is no longer required. And for the, you know, the kids, the masks they did have were not that effective. Yeah. Uh, they are fully vaccinated for what they can be vaccinated, you know, in terms of age of uh, specific vaccinations. And I think that's really the best we can do at this point. That's kind of like the conversation you and I just had. How mm -hmm. do you get comfortable with that? What do you do? And I think that's that's the case. Uh, that's what you have to do. Yeah. <sighs> you were, uh, we're coming toward the end. Um, yeah. As you think about uh, your lessons over the past two or three years, what, what have been the most interesting and surprising things that you've learned that you, you know, you've studied this for 40 years, but there probably were things that, 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 that you just could not have anticipated. What were those? Well, I think, as I said uh, earlier, you know, I've been involved with a lot of difficult public health issues. I was very involved with HIV AIDS in the earliest days. Um, I never thought I would witness the kind of, of rancor, hatred, anger, and even threatening situations as I have with COVID. Yeah. Uh, it's been hard. I've watched many of my colleagues literally get beaten up like punching bags uh, over these issues. And to me, that is so, so, so unfortunate. It does not only is it so hard for them, but it distracts from what we're trying to do and what we need to do. So I think that that was a surprise to me that I, I just didn't understand, you know, how to how to address that. How do you address that? Um, so that's that's a hard one. I'm kind of caught in it right now here in Minnesota. Uh, we have a gubernatorial race where the Republican uh, a gubernatorial candidate is taking on the governor over his handling of the COVID pandemic, which largely he did a very commendable job. Um, and so again, it just keeps getting drugged back into the political realm, which is is unfortunate. I think the second thing is if I if I had anything to share and I would myself first and foremost, but my colleagues, please understand and learn how to practice humility. Say what you know and how you know it. And if you don't know it, say you don't. But then what you're going to do to learn. You know, I've been asked over and over again, is this going to get a lot worse or going to get better? And I said, well, it's somewhere between a one and a 10. And they say, so what is it? I said, well, it's somewhere between a one and a 10. Yeah. You know, I don't know. And I think that to me would help all of us if we did that, because it would allow us then to be less charged into, you know, these positions of I'm right, you're wrong. And uh, and where we have data, then then that let the data speak for itself. But right now, I, I fear we're we're caught up in in far too much uh, uh, politically kind of motivated issues in the community and in the science world, we are far too affixed to certain positions uh, about the data. Yeah. Yeah, no question. Uh, the, this, the argument you're hearing in Minnesota, you know, you hear periodically, well, look at Florida, look at Texas. They acted very differently than California, for example, and look that they didn't do much worse or they did about the same. First of all, it looks to me like they did substantially worse. What, how do you? They did. They did. And, you know, this virus did not care what your politics were. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said to me, well, do it the way New Zealand's doing it, or do it the way Australia is doing it. Grant you, they could keep the virus out longer till they had more access to vaccine. But you know, just recently, New Zealand had the highest reported death rate on a given day of any place in the world in the pandemic. You know, and just a year before, that was the model. Right. And so I think that one of the things also we have to understand is things did change over time. Uh, you know, China today is a mess, not because they have so many cases, but all they need is two cases in a metropolitan area and they shut it down. Right. Uh, and so I think that at this point, uh, you know, there, there, nobody did it just right. Nobody has found the, you know, the Goldilocks position. Uh, I think it's all a function of what you did over time and what your experience was over time. And, and how you learn and how you adapt. So, yep. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time with us. And thank well, you thank for you. your work over the past couple of years. And I, I really do, you are a, a the, the uh, humility of someone <laughs> who knows as much and is as smart as you are is really impressive. And I think an important model for all of us. So I really appreciate it.
Thank you. I'm going to call you up, by the way, before I go to dinner. Okay, so yeah, right. you just need to know that. <laughs> if you invite me to dinner, I will sign whatever you want me to sign. I'm happy to do all of that. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Great, Thank great you. to see you. Bye-bye.